super excited to have you guys joining us today for our online gathering. We are going to kick things off with worship, but before we do that, let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for the opportunity to come together as a community online, to hear from you, to pray with each other, to pray for our family, um, and to just be a part of this amazing community that you've created for us. We honor you and we thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I'll see you after worship.
Yes, Jesus, we thank you that we can be reminded again of this truth this morning. Your mercy has set us free uh, once and for all, and it's forgiven us once and for all. And so we can enter into your presence uh, wherever we are this morning, wherever we find ourselves watching this. uh, We enter into your presence freely because you've made a way, Jesus. Um, There's no shame, there's no doubt, there's no fear. Um, You've opened the doors for us, God, and you've made a way for us to enter into your presence, into your love, into your freedom, and into your mercy. Let's spend some time in prayer this morning just where you are. If you are watching with your friends and your family, uh, feel free to just turn to each other. Ask the person what you can pray for them for this morning. Uh, There will also be a chance for you if you want to post a prayer request in the comments or in the chat. Uh, Someone will reach out to pray with you as well this morning. But let's go ahead and let's pray together. Hi, my name is Gerard van der Merwe. Uh, as you can hear from the accent and the name Afrikaans boy, uh, we at Numa Life are busy with a series that is so close to my heart. We're speaking about family and specifically speaking about God's family and we're speaking on how God restores us into family. I get to speak to you today about the Father heart of God and it's a, it's a very intimate part of my story. I'm warning you beforehand, um, I may get a bit choked up at some point, but it is because it's something where God has just so deeply touched me. And along those lines, I want to dive right in and I want to ask you a very, very personal question. And you're in, probably in the comfort of your home. You're hopefully somewhere in a space where where you're comfortable. And I I want to invite you to just for a moment close your eyes. And we're going to dive straight into the deep end of the swimming pool. Close your eyes and just, just for a moment pause and stop and think what the word Father brings to your heart. When I say Father, and maybe you're used to saying Dad or Daddy, What does that bring to your heart? We live in a society of of such broken relationship and in South Africa specifically, we have a epidemic of broken relationships with fathers, fatherless homes, fathers who are not good role models, fathers who are abusers. And we, we live in a world where that image of father is so distorted. And for so many of us, father is a painful, painful word. And even for those of us who have grown up in healthy families with a healthy father who has meant so much to us, the reality is that they're human. And whilst they have been, may have been an excellent father to us, there are still some wounds that we carry. And we so often project those exact experiences onto God the Father and onto our relationship with Him so that we so often bring what we experienced in earthly family or what we lacked in earthly family to our expectations of our relationship with God. And I want to speak directly into that during this sermon. So I want to invite you to 
turn in your Bibles to Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. And I'm going to read it for us. I'm reading from the Living Bible just because this is a story. The context is it's Jesus busy describing to people what the kingdom of God is like and what his father is like. The one who knows the father best, the one who has the most intimate relationship with God the father, is explaining to us what his dad is really like. And I want to invite you into an exercise where you ask yourself the question, what is God the Father really like? We, we know a lot of things about him. We know that he's the creator. We know that, that he sits on a throne. And so many of those things come, come with a heavy weight of an expectation of what the character and person of God is like. So I want to invite you in the story to maybe imagine a little bit of what the father's tone of voice is. And uh, we're all very familiar with the story. I hope, I hope that you're familiar with the story, but I hope that even for those of us who know the story really well, that this will bring a new perspective for you as you listen to it. So, so let me read for us. And I'm reading, as I said, from Luke 15, verse 11 to 32. To further illustrate the point, as I said, Jesus is telling them what his father is like. He told them this story. A man had two sons. When the younger told his father, I want, to, I want my share of your estate now, instead of waiting until you die, his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed up all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land, and there wasted all his money on parties and prostitutes. About the time his money was gone, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed the pigs. The boy became so hungry that, he, that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, and no one gave him anything to eat. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired men, even the servants, have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned, go, both against apologies, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you and am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. So he returned home to his father. And whilst he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming and was filled with loving pity and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son tries to, to start to address his father and he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you and I'm not worthy of being called your son. But his father interrupts him and he calls the slaves and says, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. And bring a jeweled ring for his finger and shoes. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate and feast. For the son of mine was dead and has returned to life. He was lost and, and is found. And so the party began. Now we meet another character, the oldest son. Meanwhile, the oldest son was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he heard dance music coming from the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the calf and we are f that we had been fattening and has prepared a great feast to celebrate his coming home again unharmed. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've worked hard for you, Father, and never even once refused to do a single thing that you asked me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat to feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, doesn't call him his brother, comes back after spending your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the finest calf we have on the whole farm. Look, dear son. His father said to him, you and I are very close and everything I have is yours. But it is right to celebrate for he is your brother and he was dead and has come back to life. He was lost 
and is found. I just want to pray, pray for us for a moment. And I want to ask, Lord, as we hear this story, and maybe for some of us hear the story for the how manyth time, Father, won't you allow our hearts to be open to you, to be open to what you are wanting to speak to us, and, and may we really re-encounter you in the story, I pray. So I, wanted, I want to go through the story and look at a couple of key things in it and just unpack that a little bit for us. But before I do so, I want to enrich this with telling a little bit of my own story. So as I said, uh, my name is Gerard, Afrikaans boy, grew up in the church, grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church. And if, you, if you're familiar with the Dutch Reformed Church and in general with Afrikaans culture, and especially my generation, I don't want to give too much away, but maybe I, I have to a little bit that you understand the generational thing as well. So I, I just turned 50. Um, I grew up in a household where, as a small child, my father was dad. But as you step into boyhood and into manhood, he becomes father. And uh, I, I very distinctly recall an interaction with my father where we were play wrestling and I was getting a little bit bigger, not very big, but a little bit bigger. And I sort of got the upper hand and my father stopped me and said to me, Gerard, remember I'm your father, not your playmate. So I grew up in an environment where I very much thought of my father as father. I might have called him dad sometimes, but he was not my playmate and he was not to be played with. And that so deeply affected my own experience of God and my own expectation of what God is like, which resulted in my own young faith walk becoming very, very obsessed with my own sinful nature. And I lived a life of guilt because on the one hand, I, I desperately wanted to, to do the right thing, but on the other hand, you, you young boy, you have urges and you have desires and you have things that you think about and, and things that you consider in your mind and, and, and you're confused and you, you know it's bad, but it's attractive. And, and you have this wrestle. And for many years as a young Christian, I lived in the space of God's disapproval of me, of deeply feeling and believing that the Father disapproves of me. I wonder whether, whether that touches your heart in some way. I will, I will tell you a little bit of my resolution to that a little bit later, but let's, let's first turn to the story and try and correct some of our perspectives on what God's true nature and character is. And the first thing that I want to start with is the father's response to his younger son's request to divide his estate. Um, in Jewish culture, there is the tradition that the father would divide his estate between his sons, with the majority of the estate going to the elder son, but that the younger son would have an inheritance. But that happens when the dad dies. That does not happen when the father is still alive. He remains the head of the household, at least until he is at an age where he no longer can actively manage this estate. And, and we know that the father is still physically physically capable because later in the story he runs to his son. So the father is not at a point where, where he's wanting to hand it over. But see how the father responds. He doesn't argue with his son. He doesn't tell his son that he's, that he's busy being ridiculous or that he can't. Or um, The father responds in a, to me, a surprising way because we tend to want to control. We tend to want to be the one who, especially to our children, tell them how and what and when. And my expectation is that that is the character of God, that, that God wants to tell me exactly how I should do everything. But here in the story, 
we almost see the opposite. We almost see the father giving the son too much rope, too much opportunity. He doesn't try and stop him. He allows him to make his own choices. He, he recognizes and acknowledges his son's right to make his own decisions. And so often we expect the opposite from God, but that is exactly what he is like. And so often in life, we, we have this desire that, that God should in some way intervene in our lives, but, but it's actually ourselves. We are busy making decisions that pull us away from him, but we expect him to intervene. And so often in those situations, God the Father is the ultimate gentleman that says, my child, my daughter, my son, if this is what you want to choose, I will be here when you want to come back. God is very comfortable to allow you to make your life decisions. And he is also very comfortable to still be right there when you decide to come back. So we see the son grabbing this opportunity, doing the foolish young man thing. I so understand that because my own life story parallels with this. I uh, also walked away from my faith as a young Christian after I studied to become a pastor and ran away from God and did everything I could do that was opposite to my young life as a Christ follower trying to be very virtuous. I was trying to be very unvirtuous, rather successfully, unfortunately. And the, the amazing thing happens that life circumstances stops him. In his case, the story tells of a famine. In my case, it was more of a famine of the soul, of a, of a hunger returning, of my, my rebelliousness just becoming thin and meaningless as I grew a little bit older. And, and for me personally, I, I didn't run back to God. For me personally, it was much more a story of, of an invitation back, a gentle invitation back. But in the story, we see a young man who comes to his end. And, and what I love is for so many Christians that I know, this is exactly their life story. Is that they took their own path, they followed their own wisdom, maybe even followed their own foolishness willingly and knowingly. And, and God gives us the space to do so. And then when we reach a point where we've come to our own end, to the end of our means, maybe to the end of our mental capacity to deal with this world and its complexities, when we decide to come back, we see this incredible response from the Father. Note that the father is already waiting and watching. When the son comes back, he doesn't even get close to the home before the father sees him. And that is so the nature of God, is that he, that he is waiting for us when we choose to move away from him, when we choose to separate, when we choose to break off relationship with God. He is so ready and waiting and eager for our return. Look at the father's response and, and to fully understand that we need to understand the audience and the context that Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to a traditional classic Middle Eastern environment where men did not run. You must remember in those days men wore robes, not jeans, and to run it would probably look a little bit like hiking up your skirts and you're in sandals, not the greatest shoes to run in in any case. And then there's the stigma that, that um, men don't run. You know, that's boys who are playing. But the father lets go of any sense of decency, of the son that effectively wished him dead, of societal expectations, and what society would have said what is the right thing to do and the right way to act. You know, you should be stern. And don't we so often expect God's response to us to be one of sternness? But he runs. He runs and he embraces this son who had just been feeding pigs, a Jewish man whose son has defiled 
both his physical person, but also his view as father, wishing his father dead. The father's response to him is to run and embrace. I, I wish I could hear the tone of the voice of this father because I could imagine that he's not running with a sternness. He's not running with, with admonishment. Um, he's not running wanting to accuse or even wanting anything back from his son. He's running and his first response is a loving embrace. He grabs him. I don't know about you. I'm a hugger. I love a good hug. I can imagine this part very well. He grabs him and holds him. And then he fully restores him. And that's the significance of the gifts that are bestowed on the son. The ring is a sign of authority. The cloak is a sign of authority. He's welcomed right back into the household. And the father's response is, let's feast. Let's eat. Let's drink. Let's party. Let's dance. My son was dead and he is alive again. It's an astounding response. It, it really is. And it, it is so contrary to how we so often expect God to respond to us. Don't know whether you've ever been in a place in your life where, where you felt that you'd betrayed God or you betrayed his expectations of you. You, you willingly did that very thing that, that you knew was wrong, that, that you knew would not only hurt another person, but, but would actually hurt God. And you still went and did it. And, and now when you, when, you, when you want to come back to God, you, you really want to, but at the same time, you're expecting His disapproval of you. You're expecting His judgment. And here, so beautifully, Jesus, who knows the Father best, gives us a brand new expectation of what to expect when we come back to the Father. And then just to briefly also just mention the elder son. Did you pick up that the father divided his whole estate between his sons? Yes, the younger son got his part, but the elder son also got his part. Yet the elder son, despite his closeness with the father, didn't realize the father's generosity who had already given him everything. Our God is a generous God who lavishes absolutely everything we need on us. So just to jump back to my story, I, I for many years, especially when I came back to God, had this continuous internal dialogue where I had this continuous pressure of feeling that I need to repent. I need to repent for what I've done. I need, I need to try and remember all of my sins because I, I need to try and make sure that I repent them all as much as I can. So, so I, I, I would think back to the things that I've done and when I remember something that I'm not sure that, that I'd, I'd properly repented for, I, I, I would try and ask God for forgiveness for that thing again. And uh, I, I found myself that it really affected my relationship with the Lord because I, I didn't have freedom in His presence. I, I sort of felt that I first needed to do introspection and, and try and clean myself up or at least come and confess. And an a, a absolutely pivotal, pivotal experience in my relationship with the Lord happened one time when, when I was feeling convicted about something that I'd done. And the Lord gave me this picture. He said to me, Gerard, this is how I see you. When you come to me to restore relationship, how I see you is I see you like a father sees a newborn baby. When a newborn baby needs his father to clean him, there, there might be a little bit of frustration sometimes. But this is God. This is not an earthly father. 
But there is this immense connection of love as a parent cleans their child who cannot clean himself. There is this, this immense connection between a parent washing a newborn baby, cleaning a newborn baby, even though the parent knows that probably in about five minutes or 15 minutes or half an hour, the washing is going to be necessary again. But the love of the parent for that child is unaffected. The love of a parent for their child is unaffected by the need of that child to be washed. And that is the core of the heart of the Father. His love for you is unaffected. Yes, He is the righteous one. Yes, He is the one who is enthroned. But the invitation to you and the invitation to me is to, to step out of the brokenness of relationship, to step out of the distorted nature of the relationships that we so often see into the invitation of I want to restore you as my sons and my daughters. That is what you have been created for. That is what the Father breathed you into life for, is to be in perfect relationship with Him. And the great news is it's the Father who maintains the perfect relationship. It's not us. We are His children and He understands our inability sometimes to do the very things that our hearts actually desire. As a last thought, I'm, I'm running a little bit long, but if you'll bear with me as a last thought, I want to take you to these, these very familiar verses around love. Uh, I'm hoping you know them in 1 Corinthians. and We, we all know and, and you know, comfortable in saying God is love. But what does that really mean? What is love really? And, and that's what the verses in 1 Corinthians 13 speak to. So if you'll have a bit of grace for me, I'm going to replace the word love in these verses that describe love with God because God is love. So that is 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 through to uh, verse 8. God is patient. God is kind. God does not envy and does not boast. God is not proud. God does not dishonor others. God is not self-seeking. And God is not easily angered. God keeps no record of our wrongs. God does not delight in evil. But he rejoices in the truth. God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. God never fails. Our Father is a Father knows how to love and he knows you he knows how to love you and his deepest desire is to restore you into relationship as his son as his daughter whether you are someone who've spent your whole life trying to to, to stay as far away from him as possible or whether you're somebody who, who actually walks in relationship with him but but you find yourself in a space where that relationship is is just broken and, and unwell and not whole. God's desire for you is wholeness and perfect unity. We'd love to, if, if this message spoke to you and, and you would like to respond to it, I would love to just pray with you. And I'd like to, to invite you to, to maybe imagine yourself in this story. You may want to imagine yourself as the younger son coming back or as the older son to whom the father says but 
everything I have is yours. Let, let me maybe just lead us in a prayer. Father, you, you know us so well. You are so close to us. And, and even when we are far from you, you stand waiting, ready to receive us back. I want to stand in prayer with those who, who want to come back to you. Maybe even come to you for the first time. And I want to thank you that you are so welcoming that your invitation is into perfect restored relationship. That you delight in washing us. That you delight in forgiving us. And that, that you are quick to forgive. And that you, you really do separate us from our sin. That wonderful, wonderful reality of being fully restored to you. And to those of us, uh, Father, who, who keep just slipping away, we're, we're in your household, but, but we're out in the fields working, or, or we're just not connected to you. Thank you that, that you are as welcoming of those of us who, who are close but not close. Thank you that you are always there, always ready to pick us up onto your lap, always ready to wash us when we get ourselves dirty and that you do not tire of washing us and cleansing us even when we have opposed you I praise you because you are the perfect father and you are perfect love and we so so appreciate that we praise you and we love you lord amen Thank you very much. As we transition into our time of giving, I just want to, again, as always, say thank you to each and every one of you who have given financially, who've given of your time and of your talents and poured into the Numa Life community and our city here in Cape Town. Um, it is a blessing um, to be a part of God's amazing plan for our community and for our city. So thank you again for giving. And I want to encourage you as we are preparing to give today, as always, to pray and ask God, what is it that he would have you to give into the kingdom this morning? As you are doing that, I am going to pray with you. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this big picture, this plan that you have for our families, for our city, and for our community. And I thank you, God, that as each and every one of us seeks you today and desires to hear from you what it is that you would have us to give, that we'd hear you clearly, that we'd be obedient to what it is that you say to us this morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are prepared to give financially today, the banking details should pop up here on the screen. If you miss them, you can also visit our website and grab them there. In terms of announcements, I have two things to share with you this morning. The first one is that we are collecting non-perishable food items for Mama Nook's Kitchen in Tombow Village. Um, you can drop those goods off in person on a Sunday morning, or if you're not able to do that, you can also use the offering banking details to give financially towards that. Just in the memo, just put Mama Nooks and we'll make sure um, that we get those funds um, allocated to her feeding scheme in Tombow Village. My second announcement, it's a pretty exciting announcement, okay? So I need you guys to pull out your phones or if you have like a paper calendar or a paper diary, pull that out because Numa Life Church is turning eight years old this month. And to celebrate our eight years, we have some exciting things planned. We're kicking things off on Friday, March the 22nd. This is when you need that diary, that calendar. Friday, March the 22nd, we are having a game night and you're invited. We want to see you there. So come hang out with us, have some fun, have some snacks, gather with community, laugh, smile, hug, play some games, be competitive because we've got some competitive people here. So bring your A game to the game night on Friday, March the 22nd. All right, we'll see you guys there. Outside of that, I don't have anything else for you. Love you guys and we'll see you again soon. Thank you.